my brothers, my sisters, Islam, this is the uh, first of, uh, inshallah, 11 classes in Ramadan uh, where we talk about uh, the beautiful surahs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in uh, Juz Tabarak, which is the 29 Jews of the Quran. It was reported that when the time of Ramadan came, that Imam Malik rahimahullah would clo close his books of fiqh and he would close the books of hadith and he would then turn towards the Quran because this is the month of the Quran and to focus on the Quran is what is uh, the purpose of this month. That is why we recite the Quran so much, that is why we have taraweeh and that is why in the taraweeh we try to complete the Quran. It is also for this reason why the Prophet ﷺ would revise the Quran the whole Quran with Jibreel in the month of Ramadan. So, it is for this reason why focusing on the Quran in this month is one of the most important purposes of the Sharia. So, if you're able to do so, inshallah, attend all the 11 classes with me, inshallah, and you're going to find some amazing surahs, some amazing themes, amazing topics. And inshallah, if you don't know much Arabic, what you're going to find is by the 11th surah, you'll understand so much of Arabic because when you're taking the tafsir, oh, I know that word, that word came there. Oh, I know what that means. And slowly, you know what? You'll begin to understand 20% of the Quran. 20% of the Quran or 30%. And the rest, inshallah, if you use a good English tafsir, you will pick up. Salathuna ayah fil Quran, 30 verses of one particular surah that is in the Quran that continues to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. And that is nothing but surah mulk. So Surah Mulk is one of the most important surahs in the Quran, ya khuti, one of the most important surahs in the Quran because of the fact that the surah focuses on uh, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through one important means and that is to demonstrate the power and the might and the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to see a surah that creates that impression of fear, total absolute fear in the heart of a, of a slave of God who believes in Allah in the last day, then this is the surah because it creates that awe, that inspiring awe of the massive magnitude of the power of the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Allah starts with the surah by talking about Tabarakalladi bi adihil mulk. Glory be to the king, the one who has the dominion of the heavens and the earth and all the power in his hands and ends by talking about the most basic thing that we need in order to survive, which is water. And that's why Allah says, do you see all human beings? If you don't listen to what I've just said in this surah, that if the water that is with you, the water with which you drink, and that you are thirsty, but with, without which you will die within a day or two, right? This water, if someone was to prevent the water from you, who is there other than Allah who can send the water back? And we know that every single thing depends on water. Whether you think everything surrounds the economy, guess what? The economy surrounds agriculture, guess what? Agriculture depends on water. If you think the economy is there, then the economy depends on cattle. Cattle depends on water. Everything depends on water. Our life, our living depends on water. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrates His magnificent power through this surah in Surah Mulk. This surah, Ya Khuti, was revealed for the most arrogant of sinners. We know we have sinners and all people are sinners. I am a sinner, you are a sinner, everyone's a sinner. But the best of sinners are the ones who repent. And Jannah and Jahannam were created both for sinners. Jahannam was not created just for those who sin. Also, Jannah was created for those who sin. But Jannah was created for those who sin and then repent. But Jahannam was created for those who sin but don't repent. So, Yekhwati, this surah was revealed for those people who are the most arrogant sinners. The most arrogant, haughty, proud sinners, those who think that, you know, I am the greatest and, and there's no one greater than me. And who is that that can take me to account? And I will never die. And no, I am, I'm the one who has the most money and the wealth. Who is there greater in wealth and money and women and children than me? So this surah is for the most arrogant of the most arrogant of people. It is for this reason why Ikhwati, this surah uh, deals with the topic of tawbah from a very different way. Without telling you to repent, Allah causes you to repent. Without telling you to repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you repent. Why? Because you are filled with an understanding of the magnitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's learn about this surah, the surah that was revealed in Makkah by the ijma' of the scholars of tafsir. This surah was revealed in Makkah 
And by Makkah, we mean it was revealed before the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So 13 years before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made Hijrah uh, to Medina, it was revealed uh, around that time in the 13 years. So it is a Makkiyah. And the surahs of Makkah origin are the surahs that deal a lot with the Day of Judgment, a lot with Jahannam, a lot with Jannah. And by Allah, it, it, it deals a lot with the reality that we are all facing. Yeah, some of you, as we take the 11 surahs in uh, inshallah and just about may be surprised why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Jahannam a lot does it not sound demotivating Allah is always talking about the negative aspect no the reality is Allah is not talking about Jahannam so you feel negative Allah is talking about Jahannam now so that you feel positive that Allah is warning you that there is something very severe and very serious that you are not paying attention to just like the Prophet وسلم, said if you knew what I know you would not find pleasure in sleeping with your wives he said another authentic hadith, if you knew what I know, you would not bury your dead. He said another authentic hadith, if you knew what I would know, you would cry more and you would laugh less. If you knew what I know. Right? If you knew what I know. So, Ikhwati, this is the reality that we must connect with today, which is the reality of Akhirah in Surah Mulk. Let's continue, inshallah. Surah Mulk is divided into, uh, into a number of parts. The first part of Surah Mulk, talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his greatness and his blessing and about the sky and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the sky in this amazing glory and this amazing greatness. He talks about the sky as an example to show you the perfectness of the creation of Allah azawaja. And if a creation which is the sky is so perfect, imagine how perfect Allah is. And that is why we say as-salam. Allahumma anta as-salam. Oh Allah, you are the salam. What does salam mean? Salam means peace. But Salam, the name of Allah, does not mean peace. Salam, the name of Allah, means perfectness. Perfectness. He is the perfect God. As Salam. Why is He as Salam? Because He is perfect in every way. Perfect in His names, perfect in His attributes, perfect in every single way. His words are perfect, His actions are perfect, and that is why there's no blemish in anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. It, the blemish is only in our minds, only in our inability to understand and comprehend. And that is why Allah is a salam. So Allah gives one example of the perfectness of Allah Azawajal, and that is to talk about the, the skies and look at the excellence of the skies, how perfect is it. So therefore you will know how great Allah is. Then the Quran in the second part of the first page, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves into talking about as people are being thrown into Jahannam, there is a conversation that will take place between them and the Khazanati Jahannam and the 19 angels that look after Jahannam. And there's also a man that has been created and his name is Suhq. And this man will also speak to the people of Jahannam. We're going to come to that very soon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this conversation that will take place between the Khazanati Jahannam who are the angels that are guarding Jahannam and the people that are being thrown into Jahannam. And he talks about this and he describes it in such an amazing descriptive way that you actually feel you're really there listening in as if you are the close th third person just listening to the discussion between the two so that you know. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on in the second page of this surah and talks about whether you believe in this or not. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you to account. Then he talks about the greatness of the signs of Allah talking about how many things Allah has done for you. The earth and how Allah has outstretched it, the water that he has given to drink, he, how he has made everything uh, easy for us, uh, the valleys that he has created for us in between the beautiful mountains that are stakes on the ground. Allah talks about this. Allah talks about the birds and how the birds fly in the sky. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how we live in this dunya. Imagine how we live in this dunya despite Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ability to give us an earthquake or a huge uh, frightening uh, uh, lightning thunder uh, that will come down from the sky and, and destroy us just like Allah destroyed the army of the field. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala scares his ibad and he scares his slaves by saying, do you have a guarantee Allah will not cause an earthquake right now? Do you have a guarantee Allah will not cause the earth to tremble right under you right now? Do you have a guarantee you will not die right now when you leave outside? You have no guarantees. Do they have a guarantee Allah is not mocking them? No one has a guarantee of the mockery of Allah except for those who disbelieve. So, Ikhwati, we have no guarantee at all. In one authentic narration, it was reported that one of the Salaf al Salih, he said, I met all of the ten 
of the Sahaba that were promised Jannah, the 10 Ashar Mubashireen. And he said every single one of the 10 Ashar Mubashireen, every one of them was afraid that they were a hypocrite. Every one of them was afraid that they were a hypocrite. Meaning every single one of them was afraid that whatever good was happening around them, it was a mockery of Allah. Just before they died, they might enter Jahannam. So they were all afraid. And so they led their life in fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ya khuti, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries on and he talks about if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not help you, who will provide for you? Allah is the one who provides for the birds. So who will provide for you? Which army will provide for you? Which God will provide for you? How will you ever save yourselves? And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the second part of the surah. The last part of the surah, which is the third page and the half of the third page, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about when you see Jahannam on that day, and when the Jahannam is drawn, drawn close to them, Zulfa meaning drawn close to them. See at wujuhu alladheena kafar. You will see the faces of those who are, who are disbelieved in Allah Azzawajal, very, very downtrodden and sad and unhappy on that day. And it will be said to them, this is what you used to ask for. Meaning you ask for the Jahannam, this, Jahannam is, this is the Jahannam you ask for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes off the surah by saying, O oh people, if I can punish Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and his family by giving him difficulty in this dunya, what will prevent you from getting, having difficulty in this dunya and the akhirah? If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who is so close to Allah, yet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had difficulty in his life, did he not? All his male children passed away, his, many of his daughters passed away before him, his Sahaba died before him, his beloved wife died before him, his uncle died before him. He was hit in battle, he had no food to eat for two months in a row sometimes. He used to put stones on his stomach. Yet if Allah can put his most beloved into the most difficult situations, what is the guarantee that you have that Allah will not punish you? So repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before your final end comes. And that is why, that is why it was reported in a narration uh, in the books of tafsir that uh, shaitan came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, Oh Allah, I will never ever cease to misguide your slaves until I enter every single one of them into Jahannam. So Allah replied to him and said, And I will never ever cease to forgive them from all their sins as long as they seek forgiveness. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, the reason for taking this surah is so that we may earn the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our repentance. Let's take the surah word by word and sentence by sentence. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah ar-Rahman, meaning the one who is most merciful to all, all beings and all creations. Ar-Rahim, meaning the one who is merciful specifically to the believers. The one who is specifically merciful to the believers. That's why it is not permissible for anyone to name himself ar-Rahman. Why? Because ar-Rahman is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. So if someone is called Mr. Rahman, it's haram. That's wrong. Tell him to change his name to Abdul Rahman. Okay? But if someone is called Rahim, that's fine. Because Rahim, a, a human being can be Rahim, just like Allah can be Rahim as well. Of course, the Rahim of Allah is different to the Rahim of creation. Okay. Tabaraka ladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeer. Tabarak means praise be the one. Glorified be, be, be the one. Tabarak meaning glorified and praised be the one. Alladhi biyadihi al-mulk. The one in whose hands is the dominion. Meaning in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the total totality of the dominion of the heavens and the earth. In the authentic narration it is reported that when the day of judgment comes, when the blowing of the horn happens, all of the dunya and all of the universe will be folded up in the right hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, where are the kings today? I am the king and there is no other king other than me. And for about 40, we don't know what this 40 years, 40,000 years or 40 million years, there will be nothing else in existence except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah will recreate the angel and the angel will, will, re, will blow into the horn and then, which is a second blowing. And then at that point, uh, the earth of resurrection will be recreated. So everything is in the heaven hands of Allah. Glory be to the one in whose hands is the totality of the dominion of the heavens and the earth. And he is capable of doing every single thing. Meaning he is capable of killing you 
and giving you life. He's capable of putting you to Jannah or Jahannam. He's capable of causing you to be guided and misguided. So everything is in the happens and the hands of Allah Azza And Allah has total ability to do all things. Alladhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. The one who has created al hayat, which is life. Alladhi who alladhi khalaq al maut. The one who has created death and al hayat, which is life. Liabuluakum in order to test you, Ayyukum Ahsanu Amala, who amongst you is best in deeds. The scholars of Tafsir mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he created death, then he created life. Why did he mention that? Because the asal is non-existence until brings people that Allah brings into existence. So because non-existence is the basic nature of everything until Allah brings it to existence, Allah starts off with death. Other scholars mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about those things that give rise to life which is not life as yet. Like for example, the semen and the egg of, of, of the women that are coming together, they don't, they don't have a soul blown into it yet. The nutfa, the alaqa, the mudgha. But then the soul is blown into it. So Allah is talking about death, meaning that they're still dead. Then Allah gives it life. Okay, so Allah created life and then He created death. Why did He do this? In order to liyabluwakum. The purpose of all of this is a test to ikhwati. Allah decided there to be a test, that's why He created it. And the purpose of a test is to know whether we will succeed or not. Yeah, Khutik, let me ask you this question. Do you tell the excellence of a teacher by the results of a student? Generally, no. We tell the excellence of a student, right? So our results do not indicate the result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or His excellence. It points to our results on how good a student we are. Yeah? So ikhwati, if we sin, that does not mean Allah is the one who is a bad teacher to us. Does that make sense? If you fail, that does not mean the teacher didn't do his job. It's you didn't study. Correct? If this is the case, why blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your misdeeds? If you sin, if you committed a sin and you did the filthy deeds that you have done for which you have earned Jahannam, why is it that you blame Allah saying the qadr of Allah? It's not. It's your, it's your fault. That's why ikhwati, it's a test. It's a test and we are the ones who are sitting the test. How long is the test for? Approximately three to four hours compared to a lifetime. That is how long this life is compared to the Akhirah day of judgment. As Allah will say in one of the surahs we're going to come to, that on that day, uh, yeah, on that day, فَلَمَّ يَرَوْنَهَا لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً كَأَنَّهُمْ لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً أَوْ دُحَاهَا When they see the day of judgment, they will think that this life was nothing but a morning or an afternoon, just like you have an exam for three hours or four hours, morning or an afternoon, that's all it was. So just like one of the exams you will sit now, how insignificant is that exam compared to your life? In the same way, this whole life will be like that three or four hour exam compared to your life in this dunya, subhanAllah. Amazing, isn't it? So ikhwati, so understand, understand the grandness of the day of judgment and the grandness of the vastness of the hereafter. And that is the Unfortunate thing, Yaqwati, that with this test of three or four hours, we're going to earn an, an eternity in Jannah or an eternity in Jahannam. An eternity in Jannah or an eternity in Jahannam. So the answer and the question to you all is what sort of eternity are you, are you earning? There's no middle place. It's either Jannah or Jahannam. And don't ever think that Jannah is easy. Yaqwati, let's carry on, inshallah. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا In order to test who is best in deeds. So yes, actions are a part of Iman. Yes, actions, you have to prove with your actions, not just your intentions. Yes, stop saying, oh, he intended good, he had good intentions. You know, we say that all the time. It's okay, the brother is fine, so he has good intentions. Stop saying, I love Allah and the messenger in the heart, and you have no actions. Stop saying it. Because then you're nothing but a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite because you've got no actions. A hypocrite is someone who said, I love Allah and the Messenger, but they actually disproved it with their actions. Yeah? And that is why, Yaqwati, stop saying, oh no, but my, I have good intentions in the heart. People say this all the time, I intended good. Who cares you intended good? And that's why Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said, he said, the path to Jahannam is paved with good intentions. He says, the path to Jahannam is paved with good intentions. That's true. Because everyone who did, who, who, who tried to do good, who tried to do uh, what they did had good intentions. Oh, I'm only taking riba because I want to get richer so I can give more zakat. Yeah, or I can look after my family. Good intention. Good intention. But you took riba in the process. Yeah? So the point of the matter is, ya remember this, ya 
the path to Jahannam is paved with good intentions. So your actions are extremely important. Your actions much match the rhetoric that you say you have in your heart. Okay. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورِ And he is Al-Aziz, Al-Ghafoor. Al-Aziz meaning the most honored. Al-Ghafoor, the one who loves to forgive. So the scholars of Islam say when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together, what does it mean? It means Noorun ala Noor or Izzatun fil, fil Ghufran and Ghufran fil Izzah. Meaning what? When he forgives, he forgives in a massive way. Until when you see the forgiveness of Allah, you are baffled. How can Allah forgive so much? And you, and you, have, you see honor in his forgiveness. And you see forgiveness in his honor. Meaning that he has ennobled his, his honor with, with love to forgive people. And that is how you understand one of the names of Allah with another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin tibaqa. The one who has created the seven heavens, one above the other. Seven heavens. So how is it from now until, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is how the scholars have described it. So this is the earth. Above the earth is the heaven of this dunya, which is the first sky. Above this are the seven skies. <coughs> Each sky or each heaven as large as this universe. So seven universes you might say, above this, above this universe or our sky, seven others above it. Then after this, then after this comes Jannah. Then Jannah has, according to some scholars, 100 levels, according to other scholars, 5,600 something levels. We'll come to that later, another, another discussion. So that is the number of levels of Jannah. Each level of Jannah, like the space of the heavens and the earth and the universes each one. Above it is water. Above is water. And above the water are the angels. Above the angels are the, are the other angels that carry the throne of Allah. And above the throne is Allah established in a manner befitting His Majesty. And this is the way the scholars have described how everything is above us. Alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin tibaqa. The one who has created seven heavens above all of us lofty uh, uh, structured on top of each other. Ma tara fi rahmani min tafawut. Ma tara, you do not see in the creation of Allah tafawut. What's tafawut mean? Any deficiency. No deficiency can you see in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Farji al basara. So return your eyesight back to that thing that you're looking, which is the sky. Farji al basara. Hal tara min futur. Can you see any problems, any in shiqaq in it, what, sh what is in shiqaq mean? It means any breakage, any tearing, any parting in the creation of Allah. Hal tara min futur, thumma al basar. Then return your eyesight again. Karrataini, meaning again and after again. Once again and once again. And then, and then after you look, to get, look back, then tell the person look again. And then after he's put his eye down, then said look again. Meaning keep on looking again and again. Karrataini, meaning marra ba'da marra. Meaning again and again. Karrataini, yan qalib ilayka al basaru khasi wa huwa hasir. Your eyesight will turn back to you confused, meaning you'll be so so busy looking and looking for the the problems in the sky, and that you your eyesight will turn back to you confused, meaning I can't see anything, no deficiency. Wa huwa hasir, meaning tired, completely tired, fatigued, and confused, meaning that you will not be able to find a single deficiency in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ رَجِعُ الْبَصَرَ كَرَّتَيْنِ يَنْقَلِبْ إِلَيْكَ الْبَصَرُ خَاسِئًا وَهُوَ حَسِيرٌ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this sky not only for the purposes that you know of which is to provide protection for this earth and for life but also for two other purposes. Number one is to create a beautification for the earth. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا and we have beautified the heavens with the masabih, with the lanterns, which is the stars. Can you imagine, you know, some of you might be thinking, but Allah is talking about beautifying the sky. Can you understand the power of this verse? Because this verse is talking about how great Allah is. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not need to create the stars simply to, you know, balance out the planets and whatever else. No, he created the stars also as beautification. Meaning, you know, you know, an, a very extravagant person who has so much wealth and so much money, he doesn't just buy a car just because he needs it. He buys it for, you know what, I've got a car for Thursday. And I've got another one for Friday. I've got another car for Saturday. Oh yeah, that car, that's for my wife. And that one, right, Saj? 
<laughs> that one, that one's for my, for my, for my, for my sister-in-law, brother-in-law. Does that make sense, equity? Like you know, filthy wealthy people, they spend and they spend not out of need; they spend out of like pride or, or like extravagance. Does that make sense? That's Allah. Allah is the one who has pride. Allah is the Ahlul Kibr. He is the one who has pride, and so He is saying. Can you imagine the power of this verse? How mighty is Allah that Allah didn't need to create the stars for anything except zina, beauty. Okay? I don't know about you, but if any one of you reads about the stars and how magnificent, how, how huge they are, how heavy and how burning and you know the fusion that's taking place and the amazing heat, Allah has created them. For Allah, it's like zina. Does that make sense? So can you see the power of this verse? For Allah, it's amazing. For Allah, it's zina. For us, it may be necessity of life, existence. For Allah, it's like, yeah, zina. وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ dunya, And we have indeed beautified, beautified the heavens of this, the sky of this heaven. بِمَصَابِيحَ With lanterns that, that emit light, with lanterns. And we have made it a rujum, meaning something that is thrown at the shayateen. So are we saying that the stars are thrown at the shayateen? No, that's not what Allah is saying. Allah is saying that because they are lanterns, the light of the stars is what is thrown at the, star, at the, at the, uh, at the shayateen. And what we know today is that the meteors that come out of the stars, yeah, the meteors that come out of the stars or the light or the heat of the sky as it heats up the meteors and, it, and then the meteors hurl towards towards different planets that is what Allah is referring to over here okay so the stars themselves are not hurled towards shati but the light of the stars the energy of the stars causing the meteors to be hurled that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he has created them as meteors or uh, missiles for the shati what is Allah talking about here in one of the tafsirs it is reported that Allah is talking about air power so if a Muslim, Muslim uh, country wants to know what will give you power and strength, then it is air power. Because that's what, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about again and again in the Qur'an. We have made it a missiles against the shayateen, against the, the shaitan of this dunya and the, uh, and the akhirah. And we have prepared for the shayateen adab as sair which is the terrible torment of the fire. At this point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about that conversation that will take place between the two people, right? And he talks about the situation at that simple point when people are being thrown into Jahannam. So imagine now you've changed the whole picture and now you've, you've come to this, this image in front of you or an image in your mind of the point when people are being thrown into Jahannam. At which point will people be thrown into Jahannam? The authentic hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa state that when people are being tied up, with the, with the yards and their hands are being tied up and their legs are being tied up with 70 yards as we will come to in Surah Haqqa that everyone who will be thrown into Jahannam will be tied up in 70 yards of fire and these are molten fire that will, that will be used to tie them up and as Sufyan Al-Thawri said that, the, that it will be such a severe tying that the angels will put the, put the rope through the bottom and bring it out from the mouth and that is how severely they will tie you up with the, with the molten fire uh, of Jahannam so that, that, that's in Surah Haqqa, it's coming inshallah on Sunday, we will talk about that bi So Ya at that particular point, there will be a discussion, uh, at that particular point, uh, when uh, all the people that are going to go to Jahannam are being tied up, at that point, it is reported that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get very angry. Okay, Allah will get very angry. In one authentic hadith, it is reported that all of the angels and all of the prophets of God will be, will, will be very, very worried They'll be very worried, some of them crying, some of them hugging each other and crying. And they will say to, uh, say to each other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is so angry that he has never ever been this angry before and he will never ever be this angry ever again. Okay, so angry. And it is in that point, at that point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, throw them into Jahannam. So the angels will say, Ya Rabb, how many? And Allah will say 999 out of every thousand. 999 out of every thousand authentic hadith which is in Bukhari. Okay? 999 out of every thousand people. Yes, salam. So, ikhwati, 
protect yourself from the fire. Because when that happens, it is at that point that the Surah Mulk will stand up and say, Oh Allah, save him from, from that. It is at that point that your charity will argue with Allah. It is at that point that if you have a son or a daughter that has died because you had a miscarriage, for example, sisters in Islam, if you're listening, then that child will, will argue, say, No, Ya Rabbi, don't put my, my father into Jahannam. Okay, it is at that point that your daughters, if you have daughters in this dunya, your daughters will act as shield from Jahannam. So there is no one amongst us except that we must protect ourselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's move on. وَأَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابَ السَّعِيرِ وَلِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمْ وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ And for those who have disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are too arrogant to repent to Allah azawajal, Adabu Jahannam is the terrible torment of Jahannam wa biksal masir. And what a terrible masir, what a terrible destination it is. Ida ulku fiha. When they are being thrown into it, and what we know is that people will be thrown in head face, headlong into Jahannam, not nicely pushed into or dragged into. No, they'll be thrown headlong. So a claw from Jahannam grabbing them from their heads and pulling them into Jahannam. That's how it will happen. إِذَا أُلْقُوا فِيهَا When they're being thrown into Jahannam. سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَهِيقًا There will be a huge roar that comes out of the fire. Every time someone is thrown into the fire. Because remember the fire, the fuel of the fire is men and stones. Right? The fuel of the fire are the human beings that are being thrown into it. And the jinn that are being thrown into it. We're the fuel of the fire. So every time it is being thrown into سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَهِيقًا A huge roar will come out of the fire. سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَهِيقًا وَهِيَ تَفُورٌ until it is blazing in its, in its flames. Meaning, as they're being thrown into it, huge sound will come out of it and the huge fire will go outside of Jahannam and burn outside. Meaning, you know how when you throw something into the fire, we see in the woods, some, somehow, you know, the, it starts and the fire sometimes almost about to get out of control. That's what Allah is talking about. وَإِذَا أُلْقُوا فِيهَا سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَهِيقًا Huge sound will be heard of the fire screaming out. Until the fire is burning with rage. You can barely make out the roar of the fire from the scream of the people. Yes, Allah. Meaning, you don't know which one is louder. Is it the screaming of the people inside that is louder? Or the roaring of the fire that is louder? You're only able to make it out from the roaring, the roaring of the fire, you're only able to tell the difference between that and the screaming of the people that are in it. I don't know about you, Yekhwati, but all you have to do is break a leg or burn yourself one day and you see how painful things are. You know, I'm a medical doctor and I give pain relief to my patients when they come into my emergency. You know, every patient is different. Sometimes I give up, I give, I end up giving so much morphine to a lady that I realize that lady was just overdoing it. She's not in that much pain, but she's like, you know, some people their pain tolerance is zero. Oh, oh, oh it's hurting me. What? Oh, paper cut. Oh, I got a paper cut. I mean, a paper cut is killing you? Yeah, it's really painful, man. <laughs> some people, wallahi, wallahi, you know what I'm talking about? Other people have a higher pain, pain tolerance. I don't know about you, what sort of pain tolerance you have, but the fire, ya Akhwati, is a pain that has not been created anything like it. Anything like it. تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْفِ كُلَّمَا أُلْقِيَ فِيهَا فَوْجٌ Every single type of fawj, fawj means a group. كُلَّمَا أُلْقِيَ فِيهَا Every single time something is thrown into it, what is thrown into it? فوج, meaning a group is thrown into it. سَأَلَ خَزَنَتُهَا By the way, did you also notice a group is thrown in? Meaning what? Meaning you will not be thrown in alone. You will be thrown in with the people that you imitated and that you were raised up with. Okay? You will be raised up with the people that you imitated and you were with. Who did you imitate in this dunya? Who did you want to be? Oh, you want to be like them? You want to be like them? Go ahead. Everyone will be with the ones that they loved in this dunya. So who did you love? I mean, really loved. Who did you really look up to? I mean, you really aspired to be like that. Why else are you in this university? Because you want to be a doctor, right? Or you want to be a dentist? Or you want to be an engineer? So do you want to be raised up as that? 
Is that really your goal? Is that really who you want to be? Is that your identity? You know, like today people identify themselves as, who are you? Oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer. Is that your identity? No, it's your tool. It's simply a tool that you have. It's one of your characteristics. It's not who you are. Who you are and what you do with your life is not medicine, it's not, it's not engineering, it's not computer science. Who you are and what you do with your life is something far greater than that. And that is to be the slave of Allah. So let every single person over here decide what they want to do with their life. I'm sure many of you are not doing what you're doing simply because you want to be that. You're doing what you're doing to earn a living and earn money. But the reality is, Ikhwati, in the process we forget that we are doing this only for money, not for anything else. We actually make it the reason, the purpose of our life. And that is why, Ikhwati, unfortunately many of us will lose our, our chance at this exam of, of life we will lose. So realize this, Ikhwati, and realize your true purpose in this dunya. The khazana meaning the ones who are guarding the Jahannam, which is the guards of Jahannam. Sa'alahum will ask them, Alam yatikum nadir, did not a warner come to you? Did not someone come to you, a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell you to fear Allah and to be wary of this day? Qalu bala. They said, Yes, absolutely they did. Qadja'ana nadirun, a warner did come to us. We disbelieved in him. So, Ya Ikhwati, have you noticed something? Allah didn't say, فَكَفَرْنَا Allah says, فَكَذَّبْنَا What does that mean? Meaning that we disbelieved in him, meaning we lied against him. What does that mean? Meaning that lie in the Qur'an is tantamount to kufr. Lying in the Qur'an is tantamount to kufr. What you're going to find is many a times, Allah uses the word kathib to mean kufr. To show you how kadhib is completely unacceptable in Islam. A Muslim does not lie. A Muslim never lies. And that is why, uh, that is why Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, uh, speak the truth even if it kills you. Speak the truth even if it kills you. Never cheat in your exams. Never lie about, about anything. Never cheat and lie. Ikhwati, today lying has become endemic in our, in our community. It's almost the most easiest thing to do. Lie and cheat and steal. Yeah, uh, as they say, you know, there's a joke that we have, you know, uh, uh, forgive me uh, about this if I'm r racially profiling people, I'm not really, I'm just joking. Uh, you know, as they say, oh, I've got two PhDs, and they say, oh, really? From which Pakistani university? <laughs> you know, they make that joke, yeah? Yeah, in Bangladesh, for example, on the other hand, people are known to lie about their children all the time. Oh, Bhabi, yes, Bhabi. My son, mashallah, he uh, came first in the exam and he actually came last. But they lie to uh, an amazing extent. I swear, people lie. I don't know why, Ikhwati. But people tend to lie about things and they consider it so easy. But here Allah says, فَكَذَّبْنَا And we lied. And that is why it is reported in an authentic hadith that if a person continues to lie, Rasulullah said, never lie. But if you continue to lie, then it will be written with Allah that you are a liar. And lying guides to fujur, which is transgression, and fujur guides you to jahannam. Meaning lying will ultimately lead you to jahannam. So do not lie, Ikhwati, even if you, even if you, if, even if it causes your death, even if it causes you to be kicked out of this university, never lie. And that is why Umar radiallahu anhu also said, he said, I would rather speak the truth, even if it humbles me. And very rarely does truth ever humble you, always glorifies you. And I would never ever lie, even if it raises me. And very rarely does, does the lie ever raise you. Because very soon people will find out that you're a liar. So be of those people who always speak the truth. So we lied against them. And we said, Allah has not revealed anything at all. Verily, O you messengers, you are nothing but transgression and you are nothing but misguidance. You are a misguided bunch. وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ And then they continued and they said, If only we heard, لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ Meaning, we only heard or we even pondered. We didn't even hear, but we simply pondered in our hearts about the greatness of Allah and about the signs Allah has given us. مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ We would not be from the people of Jahannam. So, Ikhwati, why do people not, why do people enter Jahannam? Or why are human beings entering Jahannam? Because they don't ponder on the Qur'an and they don't listen to the guidance of Allah That is the truth. 
When was the last time we really pondered on the Quran and therefore stayed away from the sins? It is a lack of pondering, it is a lack of thinking about our ultimate future that causes us to enter Jahannam. مَا كُنَّ فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ So they acknowledged their sin. فَصُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ صُحْقًا meaning, Ibn Abbas said, بُعْدًا بُعْدًا meaning, get away from me, get away from me. Meaning, away, away, let the people of Jahannam be away from me. Meaning, away from my, my mercy. So even though you will acknowledge your sin in the day of judgment, Allah will not accept that acknowledgement on the day of judgment. Why is that? Because Allah knows that if you were to be brought back in this dunya, you would you'd behave in the same way. Soon you would forget about Jahannam. Soon you'd be engross, engrossed in your dunya. And soon you'd go back to what you said. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, وَلَوْ رُدُّوا لَعَادُوا لِمَا نُهُوا عَنْهُ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ And if they were to be returned back to this dunya, they would go back to what they have done. And indeed they are liars. Meaning, يَخْوَتِي You have one chance to prove yourself. So you'll never be sent back. And what is your final? They bring a closer, yaqbid, and they safat. Yaqbid and safat. Meaning they are bringing their wings closer to their body and then they're outstretching it. Right? Alam yaraw ila tayri fawqahum safati wa yaqbid. Ma yumsikuhunna illa rahman. Who causes the birds to fly such great distances? So Allah says, Ma yumsikuhunna. No one carries them illa rahman except for Allah. Some of you are thinking, but it's the air that carries them. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, perhaps you're right. But the point is, Allah is not talking about those birds. Allah is talking about the f fact that there's, there's migra migratory birds. Have you heard of them? Birds that migrate from the south to the north. They travel thousands, 10,000 kilometers not to stop except until they reach the destination. Who, how can you imagine a small bird? By the way, the smallest of the birds that carries the largest distance is the one that goes from the tip of South America, right? Tip of South America to the top of America. Okay, a small bird. How small? Well, usually the, the, the size of my, uh, my uh, what do you call it, thumb. Can you see my, the size of my thumb? How small is that? So very tiny, very tiny bird. Can you imagine the tiny bird flying for 10,000 kilometers in one go? Okay, from the South America, North America is about 14,000 kilometers. How does a bird fly that long for 10,000 uh, or 14,000 kilometers? In one go, twice a year. In the summer, he will go up to north, in the winter, he'll come down to the south. Why? And who grabs these birds? And how will they carry the migratory birds? Also, there's another bird called a, uh, there's a duck, a particular type of duck. Read up about it. You can Google it, inshallah, and find out about these amazing bird, uh, just call it bird migrations. Okay, read up about it. There are these birds, uh, some certain ducks, that fly 10,000 feet up in the sky. They are so high up where, where oxygen is almost there and it's freezing, freezing cold, minus something, but they fly at that altitude for thousands of miles. Thousands of miles at one go, in one go. So think about it. Ma illa Rahman. Who holds them up except for Allah? And that's true, Ya Khuti, because these birds, if you were to think about whether they actually have the fat or the energy to carry them, they don't. So who holds them up except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَّا الرَّحْمَانِ إِنَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ بصير. Verily, he is always ever seeing every single thing. He is always watching and always watchful over every single thing. أَمَّنْ هَذَا الَّذِي هُوَ جُنْدُ لَكُمْ يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ الرَّحْمَانِ Or is there any other army that will help you with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? إِنِ الْكَافِرُونَ إِلَّا فِي غُرُورِ Verily, the disbelievers are in nothing but ghurur, meaning confusion. They are nothing but confusion. Amman hadal ladhi yarzukukum in amsaka rizqa. Or is there anyone who will provide for you if he were to withhold his provision from you? Balladju fi utu wi wa nufur. Rather, they continue in the utu, utu win wa nufur. What does that mean? Utu means that they turn away and they reject. So they continue in their rejection, wa nufur, and the perversion. And they pervert it and they are they're rejecting it. So they are perverting it and they're rejecting it. So they continue in their perversion, they continue in their rejection. Is the one who walks or flat on his face. More guided. Or the one who walks straight. Straight upon the path. Say he is the one who has truly 
uh, created you the very first time وَجَعَلَكْ لَكُمْ سَمْعَ and he has created for you a sam' which is hearing wal absar and eyesight wal afida and hearts qalilamma tashkurun how little it is that you thank him the scholars of islam may allah have mercy upon him said shukr is ziyada upon hamd so when you say alhamdulillah it is only by the mouth that you praise allah azza but shukr is not only by speech shukr is also by the heart shukr is by the speech and shukr is by the actions and shukr happens not only in the heart, also happens on the tongue, also happens in the limbs. Okay? So, Ya Khwati, Allah says, Qaleelam ma tashkurun. So, therefore, what is shukr? Shukr is ziyada upon hamd. So, when you say alhamdulillah, 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 that is praising Allah with your words. But shukr is ziyada. So, extra upon that. What does that mean? Meaning that you slaughter a sheep in thanks to Allah. Meaning that you give charity in the cause of Allah. Right? Meaning that you teach people in order to thank Allah. Okay, or you look after orphans, or you do a good deed. So shukr cannot be done except by praising Allah plus doing a deed that Allah loves. That is what shukr is. So if you want to thank Allah, you can't just say, oh, Allah, thank you. No, that's how you thank a human being. Thanking Allah means doing a good deed. That's why Allah says, Qalilamma tashkuru, meaning how little are your deeds. So thank me, O slaves of Allah. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And increase in your shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, he is the one who has created you on this earth. And to him will be your return. So why don't you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And they say in haughtiness and pride, When will this hour come if indeed you are truthful? Verily the knowledge and Allah is with Allah. And I am nothing but nadirun mubin, A manifest warner. Nadir means the warner and I'm nothing but a manifest warner so ikhwati this is what the da'wah of Rasulullah was to warn us against the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are now the last three verses of surah mulk and here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us back to the fact that if understanding the might of Allah and having fear of the day of judgment and the greatness of the signs of Allah is not enough for you to repent to Allah and think about his greatness then Allah gives us the final warning. What does He say? Zulfatan. And know this, O human beings, that when they will see Jahannam Zulfa, meaning drawing near, because Jahannam will be drawn by 70,000 angels on, uh, on 70,000 rings, each ring having 70,000 angels. Huge Jahannam. Jahannam is huge. So, Zulfatan. When they will see Jahannam being drawn close by, See at wujuhu alladheena kafaru. The, the faces of those who disbelieved will be full of si'a. Si'a means blackness, darkness, worry, concern, and uh, fear. Yeah? So can you imagine? See at wujuhu alladheena kafaru. The face will become black and dark and gloomy and they'll be worried. See at wujuhu alladheena kafaru. And it will be said to them, meaning the angels who are guarding them and make, making sure they don't run away will be saying to them, kuntum This is the Jahannam you were asking for. Because a lot of the kuffar do that today, right? Because in the haughtiness and proud, I'm talking about the haughtiest of the haughtiest, but are the most arrogant of the most arrogant kuffar. What, what, what do they say? Oh, yeah, Muhammad, if it's truly, true, truly the case and this Quran is right, why doesn't God punish me now? Kill me now, God. You know, give me the earthquake now. Have you heard those sort of people? They are the worst, the most arrogant of them, right? So they are the ones who Allah is referring to here. And it will, they will say, قِيلَ هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تَدَّعُونَ This is what you used to ask for. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu to this arrogant people, إِنْ أَهْلَكَ نِيَ اللَّهُ If Allah was to destroy me, meaning give me death. وَمَنْ مَعِيَ And those with me. أَوْ رَحِمَنَا Or to have mercy on me. فَمَنْ يُجِيرُ الْكَافِرِينَ Who will save the kafirin, the disbelievers? Min adabin alim from the terrible fire. Who will t who will save them from terrible fire? So we know the Prophet ﷺ was hurt in this dunya. We know the, the Sahaba were killed in this dunya. So if the most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa taala were in difficulty in this dunya, what will give you a guarantee, O people, O people? What guarantee do you have that Allah will give you an easy life? Allah will not punish you and cause you difficulty in this dunya and the akhirah. No guarantee at all. No guarantee at all. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَهْلَكَنِيَ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ مَعِيَ أَوْ رَحِمَنَا 
فَمَنْ يُجِيرُ الْكَافِرِينَ Who will save the kafirin مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ From the terrible punishment. قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانِ Say he is ar rahman He is the one who loves to forgive. عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا He is the one, he is, قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانِ آمَنَّا بِهِ I believe in him. وَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا And upon him I put my trust. Meaning, I don't believe in all of these things the kuffar do. I don't join with the kuffar. I don't listen to them in the arrogance and pride. I don't be proud, proud with them, but I repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I turn back to Allah in repentance. قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ آمَنَّا بِهِ Say he is our Rahman, the one that we believe in. وَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا And upon him we put our trust. فَسَتَعْلَمُونَ مَنْ هُوَ فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ Meaning say back to the disbelievers and these people who are haughty and proud. Verily soon enough you will get to know who is the one who is in manifest, manifest error. Who is the one who is completely misguided? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes up the surah by talking about water. And the most needy thing to create that urgency for us to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qul ara'aytum. Say, if, if you, will you see? In asbaha ma'ukum ghawra. If asbaha, meaning if your water was to become asbaha, to become ma'ukum, meaning your water, ghawra, meaning unpalatable, salty, undrinkable. Unusable, yeah. In asbah ma ukum gawran, faman yati kum. Who will come with ma in ma'in? Who will give you water to drink? Subhanallah. Say, Yaqwati, this is Surah Mulk, one of the most powerful surahs in the Quran. I'm going to recite to you in Arabic now as we finish up the surah. Now that you know the meaning of the surah, now listen to it in Arabic, and see if the Arabic makes a meaning to you now, inshallah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات تباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب اليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين واعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير إذا ألقوا فيها سمعوا لها شهيقا وهي تفور تكاد تميز من الغيظ كلما ألقي فيها فوج سألهم خزنتها سألهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم نذير قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير وقالوا لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير فاعترفوا بذنبهم فصحقا لأصحاب السعير إن الذين يخشون ربهم بالغيب لهم مغفرة لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير وَأَسِرُّوا قَوْلَكُمْ أَوْ اجْهَرُوا بِهِ إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ ذَلُولًا فَامْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِبِهَا وَكُنُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ وَإِلَيْهِ النُّشُورِ <تصفيق> أأمنتم من في السماء أن يخسف بكم الأرض فإذا هي تمور أم أمنتم من في السماء أن يرسل عليكم حاصبا فستعلمون كيف نذير 
ولقد كذب الذين من قبلهم فكيف كان نكير أولم يروا إلى الطير فوقهم صافات ويقبض ما يمسكهن إلا الرحمن إنه بكل شيء بصير أم من هذا الذي هو جند لكم ينصركم من دون الرحمن إن الكافرون إلا في غرور أم من هذا الذي يرزقكم إن أمسك رزقه بل لجوا في عطو ونفور أفمن يمشي مكبا على وجهه أهداء أم من يمشي سويا أم من يمشي سويا على صراط مستقيم قل هو الذي أنشأكم وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة قليلا ما تشكرون قل هو الذي غرأكم في الأرض وإليه تحشرون ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين قل إنما العلم عند الله قل إنما العلم عند الله وإنما أنا نذير مبين فلما رأوه زلفة سيئت وجوه الذين كفروا وقيل هذا الذي كنتم به تدعون قل أرأيتم إن أهلكني الله ومن معي أو رحمنا فمن يجير الكافرين من عذاب أليم قل هو الرحمن آمنا به وعليه توكلنا فستعلمون من هو في ضلال مبين قل أرأيتم إن أصبح ماؤكم غورا فمن يأتيكم بماء معين جزاكم الله خير يا أخوتي Thank you for coming today and listening Inshallah tomorrow will be Surah Qalam, very amazing Surah, all about the akhlaq of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi all about charity, all about patience, all about the story of Yunus Alayhi very, very beautiful Surah, actually perhaps one of the most beneficial Surahs of the whole Juz Tabarak is tomorrow. So if you know people, family members, other friends, just buzz them, Inshallah, how better to spend one hour uh, learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today we went over time, I know, uh, and I attribute that to the fact that I couldn't start for about 15 minutes uh, or so and then a little bit of interruptions. Tomorrow will be exactly one hour. I assure you, inshallah, as long as, inshallah, all of the audio systems and everything are up and running. Forgive me and forgive my brothers today. Uh, we're a little bit late, but inshallah, it's the first day and uh, that's understandable, inshallah. So tomorrow I'll see you all sharp at 5 o'clock. Uh, and and uh, be the uh, please bring as many people as you can so come khair samay